So this morning we are so privileged to, um, to welcome Terran Williams. So Terran is a father of five children. He's a busy dad and uh, he's an avid surfer and um, obviously because he, he lives in the southern suburbs. And um, he's been a pastor and a, and a church leader for many, many years. He's written several books and teaching and instruction courses. You're welcome to go and visit his blog site and his website, terranwilliams.com, and read all about the things that he writes about. But there's one book that he wrote a few years ago, which above all else have uh, drawn more attention to him, uh, both in celebration and in critique. And this is his book that we're going to listen to him this morning. Obviously, we can't, we can't do, go through the whole... Terran, we'll sit here until you're done. Okay. <laughs> You'll have a reading of how God sees women, and you'll see the, it's quite a thick book, and the reason is um, he was confronted with this as a church pastor in a growing mega church and denomination in the southern suburbs, and um, he had to sit down and research this because he had so many questions. Now, we as a church invited him this morning, and as eldership invited him, because you know that we've appointed Melissa as pastor a few years ago, and Siko is right also here somewhere, a pastor on the campus. And some people came and said, but shouldn't women keep quiet and wear headdresses in church? And we say, no, that's a contextual reading of its day. Let's listen to it. And then we sat down through a few of them, even in a Bible school. I mean, Shofar had, from its origins, from his Genesis story in 1993, had a pastor and a husband couple both pastoring together and being the apostolic leaders in the church for all the years. But we recognize that this is a contentious issue in the church. And that's why this morning we invite uh, Terran Williams, who wrote this book, and um, who really, God has given a significant insight. There are many, many, many books, similar topics, many of them similar conclusions. But this morning, I want you just to open your heart to not just listen to may a woman preach in church or not, may a woman not preach in church. I want you to listen to the bigger story. As God created man and woman in the garden to reign together, to rule together in his likeness, comparable to him in his likeness. So, Terence, thank you. Thank you for your humility. Melissa and myself enjoyed meeting you. And, uh, yeah, please minister from the passion in your heart. God bless you. Goeiemorgen allemaal. Thanks, Ross. So, um, the question is, what to leave out? I've given this uh, obsessive amounts of thought. Uh, you know, when you've been leading a church for 20 years and you've told everyone how it is, everyone who joined the church, I'd explain to them why the wife must submit to the husband's authority and why only men can be the leaders of the church. Explain to everyone. And then you change your mind. Uh, you've got to explain why you changed your mind. <laughs> and, of course, it's not because... And then the criticism is, oh... Here's another person who has uh, taken the pressure of the culture, and I, I write the book to say, it doesn't matter what the culture thinks, it's what the kingdom thinks. This is a kingdom value, and uh, many parts of the church have gotten it wrong. We're living in a very exciting time where lots of church movements and churches are changing their mind on this, so we're seeing huge changes in the world. I had the privilege of uh, sitting in with a group of 67 churches in South Africa last year that changed their mind on this doctrine. And they interviewed me, they all read my book, and then they ordained women right there in front of me. And uh, it's an exciting time if you see Scripture like I hope I'm going to persuade you to see it. So what I'm going to do is, there's too much to say. Uh, this is like a fine painting, so I'm just giving you a rough sketch, okay? I can't support everything I'm going to say, I'm just going to do a rough sketch, um, and then also I just want to say there's a, f a famous YouTuber called Mike Winger on uh, the internet, and he's, he's got this series called Women in Ministry, and he's strong against women in leadership. Most of my friends who disagree with the idea of women in leadership go, Mike Winger! So my friend Andrew Bartlett and I, he lives in the UK, have written critiques of Mike Winger's videos. So you can find that on terrenwilliams.com and you click on articles. Okay, so let me dive in. And let's try paint the biblical story. What does the Bible teach about men and women? And Ross said it so well. In creation, that's where we start. Men and women are in partnership. The opening chapter of the Bible, you've got God creating them male and female in His image. Then He says to the man, you rule. And He says to the woman, you bring up the kids. 
That's what we think it says. It doesn't. He says to both the man and the woman, together you rule and together you bring up the kids. Together you populate the world. I mean, that's where it starts. And then in Genesis chapter 2, it tells the story of creation again. This time, it focuses on um, Adam being made first, then Eve. Why, if you read Genesis 2 carefully, is Adam made first, then Eve? Well, it's a beautiful way of helping Adam realize how lost he is without his partner to complete him. You know, in Genesis 1, God creates everything, and then at the end of every day, God says it's very good. Then in Genesis chapter 2, it says God made man, and then it said it was not good for the man to be alone. We have a problem here. This guy looks a bit lost. And then he goes through the circus parade of, sorry, circus parade of all the animals. No, not her. This isn't the one. And then when he meets the woman, he's like, at last! That's the Hebrew word, at last! So Genesis 2 moves not from male authority to female submission. It moves from male incompletion to male's completion with his partner. And then at the end of Genesis chapter 2, it says, that is why man is in charge of the woman. No, that's not what it says. It says that is why the man will be united to his wife and they'll become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2 is not the story of uh, the, the man being the captain and the ruler. It's a story of completion. It's a story of, um, of two people coming together, joining in the mission, completing each other. God makes men and women different. Not, not saying men and women are the same, but the fact that men and women are different doesn't mean that the man, nigh, all authority goes to the man and all subordination goes to the woman. That's a misreading of Genesis chapter 2. The, come to the next part of the sketch, and that's the curse. So the first slide, if we can just put it up, is creation, man and woman in partnership. The next part of the story is the curse. Male rule becomes the new norm. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fall in sin. God predicts the consequences, and he says to the woman, he says, and now your desire will be for him, and he will rule over you. Because of the fall, God says something terrible has happened to this beautiful relationship where in Genesis chapter 1, man and woman rule alongside each other. Now in Genesis 3, something terrible has happened. He will rule over you. Patriarchy. Patriarchy means, you know, the assumption that men rule over women. We know human history is about patriarchy, men ruling over women. And uh, where did it come from? Was it part of God's good creation? No. It only comes after the fall. It's one of the consequences of the fall, that wherever you go, men are going to rule and women are going to be maybe pushed down. And uh, this is where it comes from. And one interesting thing is the Bible mentions 3,000 men by name, but only 200 women by name. Why is that? Does it mean God prefers men to women? No, it's because it describes a patriarchal world. You see, in the patriarchal world, women need to stay in the house. Men could come out into the marketplace. So when you've got all of the biblical stories where people are out in society and in community and active in leadership, well, that's where you're going to have men. The reason there's so few named women in the Bible is they were in the homes while the action was happening. Can you see how patriarchy just is part of society, covenant people. Let's just fly through the Old Testament. So already we, there's a prediction that men are going to rule. Men are going to rule. And it doesn't mean that men ruling are bad men. You're going to have good men. It's just the assumption. The man must lead. The woman must subordinate. But that doesn't stop from God from sneaking some in. Sneaking some in. Where there's a woman that lead. I mean, the, the stories in the Old Testament that I love are the stories of Esther Deborah, remember Esther? She ends up uh, being the queen of the most powerful man in the world, the Persian king, the emperor Xerxes. And she intercepts a genocide and, uh, and wins the day. And then her and her uncle Mordecai write a law for 127 provinces and a law for all of the Israelites about keeping a certain festival, the festival of Purim, which from what I understand is kept to this day. And it says in Esther that she wrote this law with full authority. 
God didn't seem to mind that here's a woman making a law, not only in the uh, civil place, civil society, the realm of Persia, but also a law for God's people. But let's not forget Deborah. Deborah. Je- Judges chapter 4, Judges chapter 5, after Moses and Joshua, before we have the kings, you have a long period of history where there are no kings and the Israel is a loose confederacy of tribes, and they turn away from God, and then the Philistines come and oppress them. They call out to God, and God raises up a local hero. Uh, They call the judges. I'm talking about the book of Judges. These are the deliverers that save the day. And God seems to choose whatever person he wants. And uh, almost every person he chooses is a loser. (laughs) Samson is like the anti-hero. Gideon is just a loser, and once he comes into power, he's a corrupt leader. You know, nothing beautiful there. But there is one leader, one judge in the book of Judges who is a good person. In fact, uh, this person is the only one that doesn't get a spot selection, like God's saying, you. Because we're told that this person seems to just have such powerful gifts of leadership and prophecy and wisdom that everybody looks to them. I'm talking about um, Mary. I'm talking about Mary. Deborah. And Deborah, we first find out, is the, she heads up the judicial system of Israel. The most complicated cases where there's people fighting with each other, they send her to Deborah, Deborah hears the story and makes the ruling. Talk about authority. Not only is she a, a magistrate, the highest uh, judicial leader, she's also the only judge that is a prophet. God speaks through her. And then, of course, she's also a military advisor. And there's the story of her summoning Barak, who's the most powerful military man anywhere. She summons him. He comes in and says, yes, sir. Like, what's going on? Here's a woman telling a man what to do. And God's in it. This is confusing. And then she gives commands to him. She says, go fight the battle. He says, I'm too scared. She says, well, I wanted to give you the the male glory of fighting a battle. That's what men do. But if you want, I can come alongside, but you're giving up some of that glory. Yes, I want you. (laughs) So he's alongside her. They win the day. And then you've got a whole chapter, Judges chapter 5, where they all, they sing a duo, Miriam and Barak. And they sing about how God has used them to save the day. And in that chapter, she's described as the mother of Israel. Some people say, God chose Deborah because he couldn't find a man. No, this is what they say. God chose Deborah because they couldn't find a man. But you obviously haven't read the whole of Judges because God has no problem. He can use anyone, even losers, like Samson and Gideon. He didn't look for a good man. He just, he, he chose her. And, and, and there's a celebration of his choice of her. So then you've got Judges chapter 4 and 5. You've got, my goodness, here's a woman leading God's people. Here's a woman who's the highest authority in the land, both in the judicial and the civic place, as well as spiritually, she's the top prophet. And here's the woman who gives orders to the most powerful man in the land. And God is celebrating it. Okay, so there aren't that many stories like that in the Old Testament. Not that many female prophets. There are some other ones. But then Joel has the prophecy. He says, oh, I see a day when God's going to pour out his spirit on all people. And I see men and women prophesying. So when Joel says that, everybody's thinking, oh my gosh, there's going to be a lot of Debras roving this planet one day. A lot of women whom the Spirit of God comes upon to prophesy. So let's jump to the next part of the story, and we go to Christ, and think about His groundbreaking elevation of women. There's a, there's a, a woman in, in my church who, um, in university, she, she became a militant feminist, down with the patriarchy. You know, she's, she's, this was her, her area of study. She thought the worst thing that ever happened was men being in charge. And, uh, and, and then she did an assignment, and she, she knew that where all this bad stuff came from. It came from religion. So she did an assignment. She wanted to look at all the religious leaders and how they contributed to patriarchy. So she's walking through Muhammad and then 
Buddha and Confucius, and then Jesus, and she reads the Gospels, and she falls in love with a man who turns out to be the first person in history with that much influence to be an emancipator of women. She can't believe what she's reading in these Gospels. He lifts them up again and again, something brand new in the history of the world. I love that story in Luke chapter 13. He goes to a synagogue, and there's a woman who's bowed down like this. She's For 18 years, she's, she's had this hunchback. She's bowed down like this, and, uh, and it says these words, and Jesus saw her. It reminds me of a few chapters before when in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is speaking to a man, and he looks at a woman, and he says, do you see this woman? Men didn't see the woman. They were invisible. They, they look at the room. The men only see the men. They can't even see the women. Like they couldn't see the children. Couldn't see the slaves. Jesus sees the woman. Jesus saw her. And then, um, and then Jesus says, come forward. And he speaks the word. Woman, you are free. And she stands upright. And then you think everybody in the synagogue is going to celebrate. But no, the synagogue leader is spitting mad. And uh, Jesus then confronts him and says, you care about your animals more than you care about this woman. And think about it. For 20 years, this synagogue leader has had a woman in pain. But as long as she's bowed down like this, not a problem. The moment she stands tall next to her brothers, woo, now we've got problems. Now we've got problems. And then Jesus calls her daughter of Abraham, which until that time... People spoke about son of Abraham, son of Abraham. Jesus is the first that we know of in history to come up with that term, daughter of Abraham, giving her permission to stand tall next to her brothers. And and, and the Gospels are full of stories of Jesus emancipating and lifting up and elevating women. I mean, his longest theological conversation we know he had was with a Samaritan woman. One-on-one Theological conversation with the woman who was rejected by the other women in her village because she had had so many relationships. And Jesus talks to her, and he reveals himself. He's the first person, she's the first person in history to hear the words, I am the Messiah. And then she immediately becomes the first evangelist we know of in the New Testament. She goes to the village, tells her friends about Jesus, brings them back to him. Jesus then does a bit of teaching on evangelism, as she comes up the, from the village with her, her townsfolk, and she has gone from a place of shame, and now she is a herald. The disciples at first were shocked that Jesus was even speaking to her. Now they're shocked that she's had more evangelistic success than they have so early. Jesus elevated women. Jesus elevated women. Let's move to the next one, cross and resurrection. The cross and the resurrection is Jesus acting to reverse the curse. The bad stuff that came upon the world in Genesis 3 begins to come undone. And the biggest evidence of this is the very first person that Jesus, who has risen from the dead, chooses to reveal himself to. In fact, the very first word to come out of the mouth of Jesus, what's his first word going to be? Woman. It's his first word. He chooses to reveal himself first to Mary Magdalene. Very first person. And then sends her. And and think about that. What's actually happening here? He's, He's in a garden. He was dead. He wakes up in the garden. He looks at a woman. He says the word woman. He gives her dignity. Uh, we are meant to go back to Genesis chapter 3, where Genesis chapter 2, when Adam lies down in a coma, God takes his part, his side out. The, the translation rib is wrong. His side, it's like he's split in two and, and, and makes this woman. The first thing Adam sees in the garden is, You are a woman. It's going back. And then, of course, we remember the first person to disobey in the Old Testament was Eve. That's a terrible shame. For a woman to carry, Jesus is going to fix that right away. The very first person that gets to obey is a woman, the daughter of Eve, Mary Magdalene. Jesus, uh, when Mary goes back to the men and says he's he's alive, they say that she's talking nonsense. Nonsense. 
You see, in those days, a woman's voice was not accepted in the courts of law. Even these disciples had such a deep instinct, they couldn't really trust a woman. Couldn't really trust a woman. So Jesus is, and when he sees the disciples, he rebukes them for their disbelief. He rubs their noses in the failure, and this is recorded in the Gospels, the most important day in history, because God wants to teach the church a lesson we must never forget, to trust the Word of God in the mouths of your sisters. Right there. Yes, Jesus chose 12 apostles. Why did he choose 12 apostles? All men. Well, the answer is, you have to understand the symbolism. There was a huge expectation that when the Messiah came and the kingdom came, the 12 tribes of Israel will be restored. The 12 tribes go back to the 12 sons of Jacob. So Jesus chooses 12 apostles. He's a master of symbolism. He chooses men for the same reason that he chooses Jewish men for the same reason he chooses 12 of them. It's symbolic. You get to the book of Acts, their symbolism is important. The day of Pentecost, Peter preaches and it says the 11 are standing next to him. The symbolism is very important. Look, the 12, the, the people of God are being reorganized under Jesus. But then you flip through the book of Acts, where do the 12 go? They evaporate. They have symbolic significance, but they're not very practically significant. It's symbolism. That's why Jesus chose 12 apostles. It wouldn't have worked if he chose six Jews, six Gentiles, or six men, six women. We read the Gospel of Luke. We see that it wasn't just the apostles following Jesus. There were many women too. There were many women too. Let's move to the next one. Church on mission. Church on mission. Okay, so we've gone through creation. We've, we've, we've gone to the curse. We've gone covenant people, Old Testament. We've come to Christ, the cross, the resurrection. Now we get to the book of Acts. Now we get to the New Testament. The church comes into the world. It's going to go. It's going to go. It's going to keep rolling forward so that one day, one church will become 40 churches called Shofar. And that's going to happen a million times in the history of the world. But it all gets going church on mission, and the book of Acts in the New Testament just captures the early launch in that direction, church on mission. And what you find is women and men in partnership. Women and men in partnership. you got Paul. He is standing at a place. He's ready for the next mission. He's with, was it not Barnabas? It was Luke and Timothy, I think. And he's trying to go to Bithynia. God says, no. He has a dream. He sees the man of Macedonia calling him. He wakes up. He says, guys, the man of Macedonia is, he's calling us. They go off to Macedonia, Greece. It's the first trip into Europe. First trip. First mission trip to Europe. And he's looking everywhere for the man of Macedonia. He can't even find Jewish men. So he sits down at a prayer meeting, finds 10 Jewish women. And then he realizes that the man is a woman because the Lord opens the heart of Lydia. The Lord opened her heart. God could have opened a man's heart, but God is trying to teach Paul something here too. Lydia opens her heart. She's a businesswoman. She heads up her own household. She's wealthy. She lives in two locations. She's going back and forth. She insists, you come to my house then Luke chapter 16, Paul does more ministry. He gets into a lot of trouble, gets in prison, leads the Philippian jailer to the Lord. He's going to leave. He's just got one more thing to do. He goes back to the church in Lydia's house. You read Luke 16 and you realize that Paul and Barnabas are leaving that church in the care of Lydia, who's the household leader. You see, the early church didn't meet in venues like this. They met in households. Especially you'd want a bigger household. So you'd need a person maybe with a little bit of means. And most times, not always, the household leader would double up as the person that wasn't only the leader of the household, but would often be a leader in the church. I've done a lot of work on that. You can read one of my articles. Lydia. And then the amazing thing is the New Testament tells us about it. a lot of these households and it mentions the names of people who led households. And surprise, surprise, there's more women household leaders than men. 
Romans chapter 16, Romans is an amazing book. Most people stop at Romans 15 because Romans 16 is just a long list of 27 names. Boring. Read it again. Read it slowly. You've got Paul, who hasn't been to Rome, greeting 27 people by name. And then he tells us in the list, he says a couple of things. Now, in those days, churches were small, 50 people, 100 people. How big was the church of Rome? Probably 50 to 100 people. He knows 27 of them by name. And uh, so that's fascinating, right? And then you wonder, of that 27, if he, Paul knows them, some of those guys must be on the leadership team because they practice plural leadership. Some of those guys must be on the leadership team, right? Which ones? Well, there's some clues. You see, as Paul mentions the names, he throws in some terms. He calls some people co-workers. He says, those of you who work hard. In fact, of the 27 names, 10 of them get ministry designations. Paul never used to call people, hey, apostle, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, elder so-and-so, deacon so-and-so. He didn't use those terms. Very, he, did, he never called people individually like that. Paul's favorite terms were co-workers. It's the word he used to describe Barnabas, Timothy, Luke. Titus, Apollo, co-workers. Or you would use the term, those who work hard in the Lord. In fact, it was his favorite description of himself. I work hard in the Lord. See, he wasn't interested in titles, interested in who's doing the work around here. So of those 27 names, 10 people get some ministry designations. Now, I hope your seatbelt's on. Of those 10 people, seven are women. Seven are women. Something radical is happening in the Roman church. Something radical is happening in the Roman church. The Spirit of God is poured out, and as men and female prophesying in Romans chapter 12, Paul uh, speaks to them about the different gifts. Those who've got the gift, use the gift. If you've got the gift of prophesying, prophesy. Gift of leadership, lead. Gifts of teaching, teach. Are there any, in the three different places, in Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, is there any sign at all that, that some gifts are allocated to people based on their gender? Not a sign. The Spirit of God is gender blind when He hands out the gifts. <laughs> the reason that you've got so many women leaders in Romans 16, is because the Spirit hands out gifts of leadership to men and women, gifts of teaching to men and women. Who's the first name listed in that Romans 16 list? It's Priscilla. I want to write a PhD thesis on Priscilla. The most exciting, exciting church planting uh, people in the New Testament, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila, Paul meets them. They, they are um, tent makers when he goes to Corinth. They immediately open up the home. He's with them for a year and a half. And uh, then he wants to plant a church in Ephesus. Uh, but he also wants to, so he goes to Ephesus. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. He's only there for a couple of days. He preaches at the synagogue. Whoa, there's an immediate response. He says, Priscilla and Aquila, you stay. They stay. He goes off for six to nine months. In that six to nine months, Priscilla and Aquila care for this new group of people. They keep going to the synagogue because they learn from Paul how to do it. When Paul went to Corinth, he preaches in the synagogue. You first go for the Jews, then the Gentiles. So they keep these friendly relations. And then they meet a man called Apollo who's going to become the, one of the great uh, teachers in the New Testament so that some people will prefer him to Paul because he preaches better. Well, Ap Apollo and Priscilla are there when they meet this man. He's Christian, but he's still got a lot of gaps in his knowledge. They take him aside, they take him home, and Priscilla and Aquila teach him correctly. They, cor they teach the great teacher of the church. They introduce him to their small community. For the next two years, Paul comes back, they're going to be there for at least two years, because we know 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, or 19, I could have my reference wrong, they are still going to be in the Ephesian church sending greetings back to their Corinthian church. They, they raise up Apollo, they send him off, Paul comes back, they're still there, leading a church in their house. And then after two or three years, they go back to Rome, and Paul mentions them first. They're probably back in leadership in the Roman church from where they originally came. Of the six times Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, Priscilla's name is mentioned first four times. Now, that doesn't mean anything nowadays. It doesn't matter, you know, 
Go back to the ancient world. Man's name first, then the woman. Four out of six times for both Luke and Paul in different parts of the New Testament to call her first, it's a sign that she was more prominent in ministry. That's all it means, more prominent in ministry. Luke, who uses her name first, whenever he writes a list of names, he puts the most prominent person first. Let Luke name all the apostles, Peter's name goes first. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, when they first started out, Barnabas was a senior member. He was mentoring Paul. So it's Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. But then there comes a day, the Spirit of God comes upon Paul. He is now the, the leader. Barnabas is now tucking on him. From then on, it's Paul and Barnabas. Paul and The most prominent person, their name goes first. I'm not trying to say she was better than her husband. She had a gift. She had a gift. So here you've got Priscilla and Aquila that do everything modern church planters might do. They relocate to a new area, they preach the gospel, they gather converts, they raise up teachers, they send them out, they withstand uh, difficulties, their lives are endangered, Romans 16 says, they nearly risk their lives in their support of Paul. They are fully invested in the gospel, not just a man, but a man and a woman, <clears throat> Beautiful story. And uh, there's all of these stories in the New Testament. You read through it and you, you just, you, they, you kind of, have you seen the movie Hidden Figures? It's the, you know, about the, how NASA put the men on the moon. Well, the first accounts were all of these ma amazing male scientists and leaders. Well, it turns out there were these four women behind the scenes that were doing the magic. So now you've got all these buildings named after women. It's possible to, to read the New Testament and to miss the hidden figures. But you have these women that God is using. So we've got this continued mission. And then Junior, Romans chapter 16, Paul then greets Priscilla and Aquila, and he says, and he greets Adronicus and Junior. It's a male and a female name. He says they're, they're, fellow believer, they're fellow believers, they're Jewish, they're Christians. They've been in prison with me, and they're outstanding amongst the apostles. For centuries, all of the church fathers were like, yo! Here's a woman who's an apostle. Chrysostom, uh, in the 4th century, he's like, how outstanding this woman was an apostle, and how wonderful her works must have been, that she would be called an apostle. I mean, well, in the medieval era, you've got some Bible translators going, scribes, they're like, no, that can't be right. They change the name from Junior to Junius. Well, of course, that's wrong scholarship, but it's showing the, the, the blind spot. This can't be. She can't be a woman and who's an apostle. Then you've got in 2001, it's pretty much shown that her name is Junior. Okay, this is a woman. 2001, you've got complementarianism. I haven't spoken about it. It's, it's formed in the eight, uh, 1980s. John Piper and... Um, and uh, Wayne Grudem are spearheading this radical stand against this tendency to treat women as equals. That's what they're doing. And they are pulling together arguments, and they, they come up with complementarianism. When I, I believe complementarianism for 20 years, how shocked I was to discover it was formed in 1987. There was literally a bunch of theologians trying to come up with new arguments to, to, to keep men in leadership. Well, anyway, about 2001, now you've got the first Bible translation where it changes it and it says, Dronicus and Junior, who were not outstanding among the apostles, were outstanding to the apostles. So she wasn't one of the apostles. The ESV, English Standard Version, joins that. You've got a brand new argument that's now taken off. Now, suffice to say, you could read my articles. It's, it's dubious arguments. These are false arguments. The, all of the church fathers were reading it right. Now you've got these strange arguments coming in. Then the latest argument is, okay, so she was an apostle, but, uh, but not, she wasn't one of the 12. That's the argument. Well, obviously not. And you see, when you study the New Testament, there's three kinds of apostles. There's the 12. Then you've got the pioneering apostles, like Barnabas, like Silas. Uh, I know Shofar's got an apostolic team. They're those kind of uh, apostles who are groundbreaking, who are laying foundations for the churches, who've got authority to ordain leaders, those kind of... And then there's two places in Philippians 2, 2 Corinthians 8, where it uses the word apostoloi of a person who's a money carrier. So the argument is maybe they were just that small kind of... They weren't, they weren't the 12, they weren't the pioneering apostles, they were this. Let me tell you, you don't get thrown in prison for carrying money from one place to another. 
They were, Jesus died and rose again in AD 30. Paul got saved in AD 31, 32. He says they were in the Lord before me. These women, Origen, the church father, said were probably amongst the earliest disciples of Jesus and saw him resurrected. These are groundbreaking apostles, a man and a woman. 1 Corinthians 12 says God gave first the apostles, then the prophets, then the teachers. It's the one place where he's actually ranking who's most strategically important. He says you don't get higher than the apostle. He has a woman who's an apostle. So you're going to argue, no, women can't be a pastor. But here's a verse saying someone higher authority than a pastor is an apostle, is a woman. You see how the, the argument starts to fall apart when you just look at these hidden figures in the church on mission. How about the controversial text? Now, notice I've been speaking a long time, and, and I finally come to the controversial text. This is where we went wrong. We said, what does the Bible teach about women? And then we turn to 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 3, and we go, this is what the Bible teaches about women. As if that's all it teaches, our mind just immediately goes to these texts that are hard to understand. The point is that you interpret Scripture through the lens of all Scripture. You don't just pull out a little piece and go, ha, huh, the Bible clearly says, yeah, you, you try to make sense of it, that if it's confusing, you come back to the whole, the rest of the Bible, and then you come back to it. You go, okay, that throws some light on it. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, I could bore you for a day on 1 Corinthians 11. I could drain your mind on 1 Corinthians 14. I could spend twice as long on 1 Timothy 2 and on 1 Timothy 3. Um, you're going to have to read my book or the articles on my website Suffice to say, we need to remember that these were written for us, not to us. So take 1 Timothy 2, uh, where you, you, depending on the translation, I do not put a, permit a woman to teach or to, and the Greek word is authentain a man. So we go, oh, Paul is telling me that we must not let a woman teach or authentain a man. We, it's like he, he wrote it to Shofar Durbanville. But that's not how the New Testament works. It says, dear Timothy... Timothy's leading the Ephesian church. It wasn't, I know this might throw you, but the new, these books in the New Testament weren't written to you. They were written for you. You need to understand it like the first readers understood it. Then you need to go, young, we're in a different situation than theirs, but I'm sure there's a lot that we can still take. See, there's a little bit of translation work. You have to understand the context. Suffice to say, in 1 Timothy 2, Paul is speaking into a context where the false teaching has so radically damaged the Ephesian church that you've got some women who are probably impacted by the Artemis cult around. The Artemis cult, you had these, these women who were independent from men and superior to men. It's false teaching that has targeted women, has got into some women's minds, not all the women, especially some wealthy women. 1 Timothy 2 speaks about women who wear braided hair and accessories. Only super wealthy women could afford that, and he's confronting that. And then says this, some wealthy women who've taken in these ideas and have basically got an arrogant attitude towards the men. They're better than the men. If you understand that, you understand what Paul says. I don't permit a woman to teach or authentain a man. The word authentain, what the heck does it mean? It's one of the rarest words in the New Testament. It's only used five times that we know of in the ancient documents we've got within a century of when Paul used it in 1 Timothy 2. Well, in the 80s, you got the complementarians coming about. They're flexing their muscles. They make the argument that the word authentane in the year 300s meant exercise authority. It must mean exercise authority. Come all these English translations. I don't permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Let's close the book. We've got the answer. No women can ever be a pastor. We've got 1 Timothy 2. We've got all. But what about the fact that in the 80s they got it wrong? What about the fact that the word authentane probably means domineer, not exercise authority? And next to teach, it means to teach in a domineering way. Paul is confronting women in the Ephesian church who are ostentatious, who have been, brought, been impacted by this false teaching, and are now teaching in a domineering way. Paul says, sit down at the feet of Jesus again. Submit yourself to the Word of God. And then he reminds them about Adam and Eve, and he says, Adam was formed first, then Eve. You see, you can't be independent and superior if you remember 
that you come from someone and you're for that person. The first thing we learn about Eve is she's equal to Adam, but she's also interdependent with Adam. She would not even exist without him, and she's made to complete him in the same way that he completes her. So Paul is reminding them, hang on, you've forgotten the original story. And then as hard as it is for us to understand, Jesus, Paul is using a little bit of humiliating tactics as he says, and let's not forget, Eve was also the first one to be duped. Now, in other places, he'll say Adam also was deceived. He's, he's speaking to a bunch of arrogant women. He's trying to bring them down to size. So when you understand 1 Timothy 2 like that, you realize Paul is not teaching Shofar Durbanville or any Shofar church or any church in the world that he doesn't want ever women to lead. How could that even be the case when the Ephesian church was led by Aquila and Priscilla? Did we forget? How could we say women can't teach a man when in that city Priscilla taught Apollo? Do you see what you do? You snatch one verse out of context, you hold it up, you go, the Bible clearly says. And then anybody says, hang on, you go like, hey, the Bible clearly says. You turn it into a weapon. It's sad. And it's because we were lazy. You've got to read the whole Bible. You've got to read it in context. You've got to try to study what the words mean. And, and you've got to admit, hang on, flip, this is a difficult passage to understand. So you've got to be humble. You've got to be humble. These passages were not written for us, to us. They were written for us. And uh, let's move on. Controversial text, continued mission. God's patience with a broken church. So you get Acts chapter 28, it ends, but it just leaves you hanging. It's like to be continued, right? Well, we've been living in Acts 29 ever since. The church keeps going. The Spirit keeps being poured out. The gospel keeps on being pre preached. You know, maybe there's 100 churches in, by the end of the first century. Now we've got, I, don't, I always forget the number, 3 million, something like that, churches in the world. The mission has continued. So let me ask you, has this church made any mistakes? <laughs> Have we ever misinterpreted Scripture? Before the New Testament has even dried, it's very sad. By the end of the second century, you've got a patriarchy that has gripped the church. Gripped the church so that you actually read every verse that could be lent in this way, in a way that's subordinating women. Um, God is incredibly patient because imagine he said, okay, well, until you get your doctrine right, I can't even be present with you people. I can't use you. He never does that. You do know when God pours out his spirit on a group of people, he is not endorsing the character of the leaders in that church. And he's not uh, endorsing the doctrine in that church. He's pouring out his spirit because he's gracious. We sometimes get arrogant. The spirit is poured out on us like, ha, ha, ha. We are sorted. God obviously has given us the tick on our theology. Um, the church made bad mistakes when it's come to the treatment of women. I could, I could tell you the greatest church leaders that we all look up to, Martin Luther, John Colvin, uh, Whitfield, Wesley, and then they, they all said things about women that would make your skin crawl because they were reading Scripture through the lens of their culture. It's what humans do. In the apartheid era, you get a few theologians, you say, just tell the whole country why the, the Bible supports this, this um, segregation of people and why only these people have the power and those don't. There we go. He has the paper. And they believe it. They're not, they really think they see it in the Scriptures. We tend to read the Scriptures through the lens of our culture. Now, the cool thing is God is so patient with the church, He doesn't give up on the church. He keeps pouring out His Spirit on the church. The more He pours out the Spirit on the church, the more it goes back to like Pentecost. 1906, you got the Azusa revival. God's Spirit is poured out. The fastest growing movement in the Christian history of all time is the Pentecost, the Charismatics, so far, and the churches I've been part of have been part of that stream of, whoa, we spirit people. Well, what happens when the Spirit of God poured out? The church rediscovers who's got the Spirit on them. Go! And you've got Pentecostalism. You've got women leading churches. You've got women leading movements. Then what happens is this outburst of growth, and then things, and then the church says, okay, now we need to sort ourselves out. We need to 
need to tighten up our institution. They look around to other movements, and they misread these texts. They say, okay, women, sorry, you can't preach anymore. You can't lead anymore. And by the time they're doing that, the movement's already dying because you're strangling it <coughs> with institutionalism and cutting out half of your workforce. And this is the story of church history. So how to be a movement where the Spirit of God comes upon you and you get the noose off your neck and you keep going in the Spirit. Let God pour out His Spirit on men and women. Who's got the Spirit? Go. Who's got the Spirit? Go. Now, I've had the privilege of working with three women from around the world. There's something called the Luzon Conference. It's like the, it's the main gathering for evangelization of the world. It happens every 10 years. It's in South Korea next year. And uh, because of my book, myself and then three other women got to write a paper called um, Men and Women Partnering in the Gospel. We got to do research around the world. Oh my gosh, there are women doing exciting things for God in the world when they don't have this terrible, suffocating doctrine. They just got the Spirit. And they got Romans 12. If you got the gift, use it. I'll give you an example. My friend Paul Van Collar leads a church in George called Hope Church. He planted a church 15 years ago, however long ago, in Zambia, in Mongu. It's grown to be the biggest church in the region. God gives them a vision. Plant churches everywhere in Mongu. God, please provide workers, we pray. And then the workers start arriving, and a lot of the workers are women. Women who've had dreams, who've had visions from neighboring villages, they say, God sent us to you. Tell us about Jesus. Train us. We're going to take the gospel out. So this church looks at these women says, well, they're the ones that God sent. This is our man from Macedonia. It's a woman. They train these women. And Paul Van Collen knows the names of these women. And they go out and they start preaching the gospel. Now, in that culture, women are chattel. They're property. But they still cross crocodile-infested rivers. They deal with the resistance to the fact that they're women. And they, 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 everyone's scared of being cursed, cursed when you go into unreached areas in Africa. They will go with the gospel. These women... Uh, he named six of them to me, Chatty and Febi and Labula and Suya Yombula and Musa, the ones that come to my mind. And uh, these women have planted 60 or 70 churches. They plant one, it grows, they plant another. Next thing, they're many apostolic oversights. They're like juniors overseeing these movements. So this Africa, but that's happening everywhere. Hey, in the Middle East... I used to say, no, you can't have women leadership in the Middle East. That's bad for business, you know, because yeah? you, you, you just have men for leadership. Otherwise, it would be misunderstood. Well, when you're an underground church, you're not in for branding. Hey? You're just in for the real thing. So I've got a friend, Dr. Katia Adams. She planted, she was in South Africa, Middle Eastern descent. She's planted in Boston. She's the senior pastor of her church, the Table Church. Her husband co-leads with her, but he's a prophet who travels around the world. She comes from the family that has spearheaded the Iranian revival where 100,000 Muslims have come to faith in the hundreds of underground churches that have been planted. So I asked Katya, what percentage of those churches are led by men to women? She says 50%, 50%. Imagine you go to those 50% 50 of underground churches and say, we're shutting shop, you're sinning. It's absurd. Well, how about South South? Asia and Southeast Asia, where there's radical gospel growth. My friend, Dr. Leslie Sagraves, she's been part of projects where in the last 10 years, uh, 4,000 women have been trained and have planted churches in 20,000 villages. So you got, there's a lot of stir and contention because, because we're watching America where things are slowed down for the gospel there, but they're flipping exciting down here in Africa. And we're watching these guys battling it out in the death of institution and watching these arguments. And it's sad. And let's get our eyes back on the prize. Men and women partnering in the gospel. I am in a church led by men and women. And men and women preach. And, uh, yo, it's so much cooler. And it's so simple. You know, it, it's, sorry, I feel weird that I had to write a book this thick just to say it's cool, guys. <laughs> but but if, if you didn't know anything and you just came to a church, your first church, it would just be so self-evident that a leadership team with men and women, uh, where those gifted with leadership, regardless of gender or leading, it's just so much healthier. Church leadership teams, they're always making decisions. I don't know, 50, 100 decisions you're going to make every year. You want diversity. <laughs> you want diverse perspectives. 
I've been a church leader my entire adult life. I can tell you now, if you only got boys in that room, you're going to make some dumb decisions. If we just had a few wise women in that room, they would have said, yo, not like that. No, you don't. No, no. They would have just seen a red light flashing when the boys didn't. Uh, a woman was preaching in my church, and a, a guy invites his dad, who leads a college that is strong, complementarian, only men can lead. She's feeling so nervous because there's this guy who is the complementarian professor in the room while she's preaching. She's, and after as he comes up to her after she's preached, and she's like, oh, I'm in trouble. And he says, can I have your notes? He says, I realize why, I need to, why we need to hear what women say about Scripture, because men would never have seen what you just saw. You can hear men and women partnering together in the gospel. Men and women partnering together in the gospel. Um, it's the way of the future. It has come upon us in the spirit, the continued mission of the church, and, um, and it's cool. And uh, I don't know what else to say. I've run out of stuff to say. I mean, I could say more, but I think I'm done. Bye, Duncan. Amen. You should hold on to your book. This is his last printed copy that he has. Um, so thank you so much, Taryn. Yes, so I'll put a list there where Dolph is. Dolph is Dolph Weigerai Hunt. Thank you. I'll put a list there. It's going to be a handwritten note. Um, but just to write down your name if you want. He usually sells for 280. He's going to give it to us for 200 Rand a copy. So if we want the first batch of the printed copies, we're welcome to just write it down. We'll pick it up later this week whenever it arrives. Amen. We're going to invite people to ministry this, to this morning. Can I ask, just as we always do, that if you have ministry needs, that means you have a need on the inside to connect to Jesus. You've got a need for healing. You heard something and God needs to do something. Can we allow space first to those people? And then if you just want to talk, because this was interesting to you. If you have an intellectual debate, can we just wait a little bit? Okay. Amen. So elders, please come forward. We'll do some ministry. Father, thank you for your word this morning, God. I thank you, God, for the gift in your gracious creativity. That there's a diversity, God, that you made us different, God. You made us to bless one another, God, to be interdependent. And Jesus, we thank you for the miracle you did on the cross in your resurrection to reverse the curse, God. I thank you, Lord, for the names of people in the Bible that are women, that are leaders, that have been gifted by grace. God, we thank you for the prophecy quoted over and over in the New Testament, God, that you will pour out your spirit on men and women who will speak on your behalf and minister on your behalf, God. And we thank you, God, in this church for women that have received your gifts, God, to do ministry. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we just want to say again in this church, God, and in the churches that we will plant, God, we will open up, Lord, so that by your grace, your spirit will not be quenched when it comes through a woman, in Jesus' name. We pray for wisdom, we pray for grace, God, and we pray, Lord, that you will grant us a grace, Lord, to not be arrogant or conceited in the way in which we administer your grace, in Jesus' name. Let your kingdom come. Amen. Amen. Worship team, you're welcome to do some ministry, uh, to do some music. Please have a cup of coffee. If you need some ministry this morning, I want to especially invite those with a word of knowledge beforehand, if you have a need for healing in this area, would you please come forward so we can pray? And secondly, if the person with the physical healing need, if you can come forward and just seek out Karin this morning. Amen. Bye, Donkey.